So I'm going to bring in them now. And then by that time, those who are at the other link will hopefully find their way here. And then we'll start. And again, my apologies. So one moment. So Claire, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna do the introductions. Some people are trustees are still joining us. I'm gonna do the introductions and then we'll have a verse when we're all gathered and we'll begin. So friends, <clears throat> Thoreau said it is time we had uncommon schools. It is time that villages were universities. So ours is an uncommon school. And part of what makes it uncommon is that we believe that those, speaking for myself, I believe that those who are spoken of as dead are really quite alive, um, alive and well. Obviously we know their physical bodies are laid aside, their mortal coils, but their spirits I would say live on. And indeed, who hasn't said at one point or another, so grandpa came to mind, grandma's in my thoughts. Um, up to about the last century and a half, it was very obvious that our ancestors are with us. And so I have with me on the phone, Claire Russell, who some of you know, who's a close colleague and a valued advisor. In Claire's gifts are summarized by her name, which is Claire. Claire is clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient. I don't say that myself as a God's truth. I offer my best thoughts. You, everybody can determine for themselves what their heart says about these matters. But, um, that's what I've taken from my years working with Claire. So we have with us on behalf of, or we've invited to join us tonight, those whose shoulders upon, upon which we stand here in Concord, the Center for American Studies going back to this Michael School, the Concord School of Philosophy and Literature, which ran from 1789 to 1788. I met Claire when I was invited to give a talk or an offering at the bicentennial anniversary of Thoreau's birth. And my talk was on Henry David's clairvoyance, clairaudience, and clairsentience. And before I began, I noticed Claire, I didn't know her then in the audience, she caught my eye. And afterwards, as some of you have heard, she came up to me and said, Stuart, no, she didn't know my name. She said, I understood what you said. Henry David understood what you said. And then she was overcome with tears. She'd said later that she had felt a nudge in the middle of her back to encourage her to come forward. She normally doesn't speak up in this way. But when she was overcome by tears, I reached out my hand and took hers. And I said, is there anything else you'd like to say? And she told me the story of a, the now grown woman, but who was born with these gifts, which others have of clairvoyance, clairaudience, and clairsentience. And that she thought like many do, that this is the case for many, many people and discovered, no, it's not. She described a visit to Concord where when she was young and she went to the orchard house, which she loved. And then she went to the Emerson home and went up the main stairway and turned to the right in the little room where Henry David was and um, connected with him as one can do with these gifts. And then lost the connection until in her latter years, a um, book catalog arrived with Henry David Thoreau's picture on the cover, and he winked, so to speak, at her. Well, this is a longer story, and it's to introduce 
those who are with us. Claire isn't so much a medium, but she's a communicator um, or who've been invited. How many are with us? You know, we'll, we'll see. But there are many people who speak of these gifts. So like I like, I think all of us take it with a kind of a grain of salt. So I made an effort, I made a went to went to devoted the time to getting to know Claire after she introduced herself. And um, we ended up in front of the Concord School of Philosophy, to which I brought Marin the other day and, and Andrew yesterday and others. Um, and Claire asked if I had anything I cared to say to Henry David Thoreau, my old friend with whom I felt I'd been working for years, working with for years as a native son of Concord. And I was moved to ask him, Henry, did you really mean to stand to, to defend John Brown's use of violence and even murder in order to you know, justify his abolition cause? And Henry said, as Claire communicated, I stand by my words. I thought, well, who am I to question this old friend of mine? So I let it be. And about two weeks later, I was in a canoe in northern New Hampshire, talking with Claire on the cell phone. And she said, Stuart Henry has jumped into the canoe. And he wishes to tell you that he's thought twice about your question. And he said that it is, he realized it is blasphemy to take the life of another. Well, whether that is or not, the point is that the bridge goes both ways. Any thoughtful person knows inspiration can come down from on high, but we can also offer up something from below. That's the work of the Center for American Studies. And a second instance of how that works, I'll offer before introducing those who are with us or who've been invited on high, because that is the nature of our work. In the second instance, as I came to know Henry Moore through Claire's communications, I said to him once, have you and Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, been in touch? And Henry said, no. And I said something not particularly profound. I simply said, that's a shame, because that's what I felt. Because here on earth, we divide and we're conquered. So they're the Throvians and they're the Emersonians and they're the Alcatians and on and on and on. And that's, so I said, that's a shame. Well, that modest offering, offering up to them led Claire communicated to Henry and Waldo connecting. And Henry, dis Claire described that they were together and Waldo said, nobody knew how much I loved Henry. And then he paused and he said, I did not know how much I loved Henry. And then he was overcome with tears. So friends, this is a nature of the work. And so I'd like to share with you along with Claire, thanks to Claire, who's been invited to join us tonight. There are these old colleagues, Emerson Thoreau, and then great transcendentalist scholars who we've worked with, Center for American Studies, and then former center trustees who are no longer on the earth. So this is a part we have a lot of important work before us. And our task is to bring together the heavens and the earth. So I would, I want to read out their names. Again, this isn't the God's truth. I'm not expecting people to just buy what I say. Your hearts will tell you whether it makes sense or not, but I want to read out the names. And then also those trustees who are not with us, um, many of them are ill, and I'd like us to know so we can hold in our consciousness, if I may suggest, what they're bearing. So on high with Claire, and Claire, do you want to offer anything at all? Um, Claire's computer is not working, so I have her on the phone, and I'm speaking 
in front of the computer on the phone. Do you wish to say anything, Claire, at all before I introduce who's been invited to join us? Um, I can say this. I wish I could see you all. Um, over the years since I've been doing this kind of work, this communication work, which actually I haven't been doing for a long time, a particularly long time, but as Stuart said, I was born with these gifts. I just didn't really do anything with them. I was just aware of them in the way that I perceived life and my world. Uh, since actually I started doing serious communication work when I met Stuart at that bicentennial, that's when it really began. And what I've learned since I began the work, and I learn every time I do the work, every time I do a communication with departed soul, I learn something new every time. Because every time is different. But what I have learned, the main thing, is that we are not disconnected from our souls who have gone before us, either friends or family members. They are living their lives as we do, it's just that they don't have bodies. But they have lives in their world. They have work, if they choose to. They have hobbies. They go on little trips. They have friends. They have relationships. So they carry on basically the way they did here. It's just that they're pure soul. And so when I talk to them, I give them all of the respect that I would give a friend or family member in this world. I am not, I never take them for granted. I don't assume that if I call on one of them, that they are going to say, oh, okay, sure, I'm available. They're not always available. They might have something going on. But I can ask. And with the highest respect, they've come because I've been doing this work now for almost seven years, a lot. Um, they, the people that I talk to mostly, I call them the transcendental family um, because they are the ones I work with most. They've come to know me and trust me. So they usually, without fail, make themselves available to me. They know that I'm going to speak truth. I'm not going to twist their words or say things that they haven't said. And I do that with every soul that I communicate with. Um, but I guess just to sum it up, to, re to reiterate what Stuart said, there is a connection here that we do not lose. We may not be aware of it. I think probably it's safe to say that most people in this physical world are not aware of it. They maybe don't think about it, or if they do think about it, they reject the notion because they think it's crazy. Or they're imagining things. And that's a very sad, sad thing. Because it's not true. So I feel very blessed and privileged to have been given these gifts, even though growing up it was a challenge. Because, as Stuart said, when I was young, when I was very little, I thought everybody was like this. I didn't know that people could see things and hear things. I just thought everybody did. Well, then, obviously, as I got older, I realized that wasn't true at all. And trying to fit myself into this world with these just has been hard. But with my communication work, I have found a way to fit myself in to the world by helping people who want to speak to their dad or their mom or their brother or a friend 
or the people I love to talk to, my transcendental family, I can help them do that. And if I can't reach the person that I that I'm asked to try to reach, if I can't, I say that I can't. I don't lie. I don't make things up. I just say whoever it is that I'm asked to talk to isn't available. They aren't, they're not coming forward. So, um, and that does happen. If I have a new person, just say someone who wants to talk to their departed father, say, that departed dad doesn't know me. He may not want to talk to me. And so I can use sometimes, I use the person's name. Like, in other words, like your daughter, your daughter Janet would love to talk to you. And she can't hear you. But if you talk to me, I can tell you, tell her what you are telling me. So sometimes if I use the person's name, it helps break the ice where the person then feels free to talk to me. Um, but that's digressing a little bit. I'm just trying to explain how some of these things work that I do. But as I said, the most important thing that I've learned is that we are still bound together by common purpose, even, even though there are different worlds that we are living in. The common purpose being truth, love, integrity, passion, humor, justice, and all of the good virtues and qualities that we have such a hard time in this world manifesting, some of us, maybe most of us. So our dear friends on the other side in the other world, they can help us achieve those goals. They can support us, they can love us, and they can be there for us. They can't change anything for us. They can't do our work because that's not their job. But they can be, um, they can cheer us on, so to speak. They can cheer us on. And, know, and we can know without a doubt that they love us and are wishing us well. So I guess that's about all I had to say. Beautiful, Claire. Beautiful. I've heard you speak of your work often over these last seven years or so. Um, hardly ever in such a clear and illumined way. Thank you. And again, friends, this isn't offered as a God's truth. You'll know in your hearts whether what we say makes sense or not. So I want to introduce those who've been invited from on high. And imagine, friends, as we go forward with this work, imagine having alongside us in spirit, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ellery Channing, Bronson and Louisa May Alcott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Sophia Hawthorne, our Joan of Arc, Margaret Fuller, I believe. She doesn't like that expression. No, she doesn't like that. <laughs> right. The, the great and good Walt Whitman. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume everything belonging to me is good belongs to you. The author of Moby Dick, Herman Melville, William Torrey Harris, the guiding light of the Aristotelian school in St. Louis, Dr. Hiram K. Jones, the guiding light of the Neoplatonic school in Illinois, William Ellery, Franklin Sanborn, Daniel Chester French, these are many of them Concordians who sculpted the Lincoln Memorial, Thomas Whitney Surrett, who played the organ at Emerson's funeral. Odell Shepard, one of the great authors, transcendentalist scholars in the 20th century. A colleague of his, Walter Kenneth Cameron. 
Stanley Cavell, the great Emerson scholar at Harvard, Francis Edmonds, a founder of, of Emerson College in Sussex, England. And then we have former center trustees, as many of you are. We're on the other thought side, but as close as can be. Bill Bodum, Bill Barnes, John Burke, Betty Plimpton, John Moses, Richard Kotlar, center trustees, and then one of the great transcendental authors and scholars and friends, Bob Richardson, a knight in shining armor, O'Neill LeBlanc, the former president of the Thoreau Society. These are colleagues, Ed Schofield, the former director of the Concord School of Philosophy and Literature, John Chateauneuf, and then Christopher Roof. So these are people who I believe are near and dear, are dear and near, have been part of the work. And now before we start formally, I want to say the names of those center trustees who are not with us because they're not well. You heard their names a number of times, but I want to repeat them so you can begin to acquaint yourself at least with their names. And once we're all together, since we have new trustees, including in this circle, we will, once we're all together, we'll have a formal introduction. But I want to do that properly when more of us together. So those who are not with us for health reasons, Susan Clark will be with us momentarily. Um, Rob Frabone, one of America's great record producers who's consulted with Bob Dylan and Paul McCartney and so on. Rob lost his third wife, not by divorce, but by life and death. And he's still recovering. We're in touch more, but it's been a real blow. Um, Brian Lynch, one of the oldest center trustees, a man who has the wisdom of the three kings, this incredible star wisdom. He's been bearing Parkinson's for about 30 years. And um, life is very difficult for him. When he, when he can communi communicate, he does. Patrick Wallace, a great, great grandson of the founder of Tuskegee University is recovering from brain surgery. Doug George Cantanillo, one of the original trustees of the American Indian Smithsonian Institution, the husband of Joanne Shenandoah, the great folk singer, not only lost Joanne two Thanksgivings ago, which was a tremendous blow, but he was asked to head up the work to, to, to discover and identify the remains of students who went to the Carlisle and government schools, Native American students who never matriculated because they never survived. And he's been asked to discover and identify the remains of these children. The motto of the Carlisle schools was to kill the native, the Indian in order to save the human being. So Doug is not with us because he's bearing a considerable load. Patricia Ann Davis, a Hopi elder and international educator who was asked by her father at eight years old to enter into the white man's thinking system and to redeem it. Patricia communicated about two weeks ago, she's been quite ill and under tremendous amount of pressure. Patricia Ann Davis, her native name is Loving Peacemaker. I invite you also to keep her in mind and going back for a moment to Doug George Cantanillo. He turned down a meeting with the Pope a year ago because it was just a photo op around the responsibility of the Catholic Church for what they've done to the native peoples with these schools. Then we have a very interesting story with one of my oldest and dearest friends who I suspect a number of you have heard of, Patch Adams, the doctor from the movie. Patch, and I wish Susan were here, she'll be with us, um, has been under duress for people of the significance of someone like Patch Adams, whose film was 
one of the most popular films and then a TV series. series. Um, when people emerge in the scene and speak out in an in a uncompromising way in terms of reform, and Patch has been taking on the medical system and the insurance system and the pharmaceutical system, then um, people are brought into their life in order to undermine them. And this is a situation with Patch, so that, that, that thanks to his supposed lady friend, God bless her, I don't have any more contact with Patch. We tried three times to get him Bobby Kennedy's book. Bobby signed it three times about Dr. Fauci and this whole drama. And they kept it away from him. And they also kept medicine from Patch that could have helped him after he was jabbed and went through that whole process. So this is part of the, our work and part of the drama. Patch Adams isn't with us tonight. I trust he will find his way back. Willard Sunstein has um, a burdened heart. He's not with us. Carmina Gorga, our center scholar, simply can't hear. He's in his later 80s and he just can't hear in these calls. So we're gonna be visiting him tomorrow. Um, and then Von Scott, a new center trustee. Um, he's in a league of his own. He, um, he was 15 years a senior lawyer at Chase um, until they asked him to fire his division. He said, I think I will fire myself. And um, he quit. Um, the legal system was getting to him. He ended up taking a stand. He ended up jailed. While in jail, he was arrested for getting 12 fellow prisoners out of prison while he was in jail in a wheelchair. Uh, when he was being beaten up by the police in a ditch, he yelled, stop. And they were surprised that they stopped. And he took a deep breath and he said, you can continue now. And as you can perhaps imagine, they were so discomfited by this moxie that they stopped. So that's Vaughn, who has a disease that only 43 people on the earth have. That's a combination between Lou Gehrig's disease and multiple sclerosis. So we have a rather remarkable cast of characters, but they're burdened. I trust they'll find their way back but I'm glad to share them with you. I've alluded to them. I wanted to give you a fuller picture. And with that, I'd like to offer our opening verse and then we'll turn to quite a remarkable um, agenda for this evening. A lot is unfolding. So thank you, Claire. Um, thank you those from on high who are with us and let us hold those trustees I've mentioned were unable to be with us because of health reasons. Our opening verse, friends, goes as follows. May our feelings penetrate into the center of our hearts and seek in love to unite themselves with a human being seeking the same goal with the spirit beings who bearing grace, strengthening us from realms of light and illuminating our love are gazing down upon our earnest, heartfelt striving. So once more, if I may, <clears throat> may our feelings penetrate into the center of our hearts and seek in love to unite themselves with the human beings seeking the same goal, with the spirit beings who bearing grace, strengthening us from realms of light and illuminating our love, are gazing down upon our earnest, 
heartfelt striving. So friends, we have a number of agenda points tonight, including a review of the most recent events. But I wanna start with the email and the crescendoing concert of concerts. It's a bold title, the concert of concerts or the crescendoing concert of concerts. And the purpose is just to do some brainstorming. And then what we'll be moving to are working circles around these different initiatives. And I hope Susan, you can hear us. Our working circles around these initiatives. Um, so I wanna simply read what was emailed to you all and invite feedback. So under the crescendoing concert of concerts highlights, there's a quote by Ben Franklin, there'll never be peace in this land until justice is done to the native peoples. And I add, given that this land, America, is the leading land of our time, the slope being a slippery one, until there's peace in our aspiring United States, there'll not be peace globally. Rather, war, conflict, and its ramifications, hunger, thirst, lack of shelter and medicine, poverty and despair. Whatever you do to the least of your brethren, you do unto me. That's the first quote, introducing the crescendoing concert of concerts. The second is by the chairman of the, the secretary of the treasury and the chairman of the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference. The aim of the Bretton Woods Conference was the creation of a dynamic world community in which the peoples of every nation will be able to realize their potentialities in peace. And I write, might it be time to give more than lip service to such words? So the crescendoing concert of concerts, we speak of it as the Walden Earth Care and Live Aid II concert. Number one, it's a veritable labor of love that aspires to effect the shift from the Great Reset to the Grand Concordian Jubilee. Towards that end, all, all proceeds will go to lifting the fortunes and spirits of those spoken of as the wretched of the earth at long last. That is, no one profits directly from the concert, i.e. is paid by the organizers, including if Paul McCartney's with us or whoever, unless their fortunes are more dire than the wretched noted, beginning with the native peoples on these shores. If your circumstances are more dire, saying to a Paul McCartney or promoters or, or, or producers, whatever, let us know and we'll do all we can to meet your needs. That address, the bottom and top lines follow. The initial venues in time, Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, the Emerson Field, July 4th, 2023. Since this is a crescendoing concert, we don't have to do it perfectly and completely. The next time or the time after that or the time after that, it's a crescendoing concert. The second venue, Mount Washington Hotel at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, September 29th, Michaelmas. The performers, the universally, the universally sung, the Don Henleys, who has performed a number of times in Concord in connection with Walden Pond and Walden Woods, Patty Smith, whose daughter was at a program we did last summer. James Taylor, who's from the area and knows Concord well. Martha Reeves, who we've worked with of Motown. So the performers are the universally sung of all nations and races in both their sunset and sunrise years and the unsung heroes. 
So we'll be reaching out to countries maybe that people have never even heard of and say, who are your celebrated artists? We want to involve them. This isn't just the first world artists, but who are your celebrated artists in Trinidad and Tobago and, and you name it. Um, young and old alike. I don't know if you all have seen these shows, America Has Talent, but it's mind blowing to see these modest, humble, nervous children step onto the stage and they open their mouths and the angels are singing. Um, the cause is so significant, the shift from the Great Reset to the Grand Concordian Jubilee, that um, everybody, all hands on deck, so to speak. So this is for the universally sung heroes and the unsung heroes. Resounding is the next point. This will not be the day the music died. I think you all know the song, Bye Bye American Pie, but the day the music was resurrected thanks to an emerging technology by one of America's grand old record producers, who's one of our trustees, Rob Fraboni, I've mentioned. So let's, I'm gonna pause here. I'm sorry, I've been doing a lot of talking to try to bring these threads together, but I just want to have this, this working session around these different initiatives. So I'd like to invite comments. And we've begun, Susan Clark, who I hope is with us. Um, Susan, can you hear us? Hang on one moment. I don't know if Susan can hear us. Um, so we began with the um, with an overture, Susan twice sang quite a moving piece for our gathering on the 19th of April. Um, so, we sounded the early note, but let's, let's, I'd like to invite feedback. I'd like to, for instance, ask Huda if you could speak, if you'd be so good to those who may not be as familiar with this shift from the Great Reset to the Grand Concordian Jubilee. And then if Glad or Corin you wish to speak about, and Andrew, the, um, the 50th year anniversary of hip hop, and um, the whole tradition of Bob Marley from Jamaica. Um, but Huda, can you, can you speak to this shift from the Great Reset to the Grand Jubilee, which is really what this crescendoing concert of concerts would help to facilitate? Um, well, great to see everybody here today. Welcome, Huda. Thank you. Um, I'm not really sure um, what to see at this point right now. So I'll skip, restore it. Can you, can you speak about your 13th Federal Reserve portal and what its purpose is, Huda? Um, 13th portal is, basically design and adjudicating the treasury and to cure and correct um, what was created um, in 1913 uh, to forgive debts, not just to create them and, um, and to speak to Jubilee as opposed to reset for everyone. Mm 
Buddha, you are you are at a loss for words to speak of your vital work. It's, yeah, it's 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 been a long a long day. Um, Well, I'll I'll say a word, and then maybe Corinne can pick up the thread. The way I've come to understand Huda's work, and she is adjudicating the U.S. Treasury, and in so doing, she's reminding them of what their purpose is as the U.S. Treasury. That is, they're part of the government. They're our public servants. The way I've come to describe it, and Corinne can perhaps pick it up, is that before the Federal Reserve existed, it didn't exist. And then people had an idea or notion, and they came together, and they created our debt and death-based monetary system. Buddha and the Center for American Studies and others are working together to redeem that. Coming together as they came together, those respectable scoundrels to create our debt and death-based monetary system in order to create a consecrated monetary system. Monetary system that's based on credit, not on debt. And this concert would be a fundraiser in order to prime this pump, excuse the image, to prime this pump so that money can be consecrated and it can flow out our lifeblood into the world where it's desperately needed, not just in Huda's home country of Ethiopia, which is in a crisis mode native peoples on our shores, in many other places. But money can become vitalized, if it can become consecrated, it can lead to healing in our time. Corinne, do you want to build on that since you've been working closely with Huda in this in this arena? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, so um, basically they've been printing, they, they, from the last recession, they, whoever they are, have given a green light to bankers all around the world, just keep printing and creating credit. So we're now seeing a steep incline, the steepest incline in credit creation in recorded human history. And the more money that they print, they're seeing the disparity and concentration of wealth from the real economy. And they're saying that the only way this kind of a disparity historically has been resolved in terms of those that have and those that don't have is through war or, or natural disaster, meaning collapse is the only way you can resolve this, this economic precipice that is going on, whether we like it or not. They've since tried to moderate the trajectory by introducing inflation and other sort of control factors that's creating its own shock in terms of bank collapses and other things and, and of course they're just making it up as they go along the vast majority of the population may just be passengers compared to the those that are in the cockpit <clears throat> but Huda herself chose to get to go into the cockpit and start to come to address the courts and the treasury officials and challenge them to rethink the, 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 the language, the approach that they're taking in this, in this experiment. Not, not everybody would choose to do that, but that's what she has done. And the Center for Concord, Center for American Studies, as I see it, has become a qualified stakeholder in addressing this matter because it is the custodian or the curator for the Bretton Woods Monetary Institute and does have the capacity, as I see it, through stewards and all the expertise at the table 
to be a gathering point for broader participation in this uh, reality check. How much more money do we need? <clears throat> How do we connect money to the real economy? And who are we when we ask these existential questions? You know, living beings or straw people? So <clears throat> that don't have a stake in the in the conversation. So what I like about the Center for American Studies it's an open invitation brain trust or community trust at the heartbeat of the American Revolution, the heartbeat of the, the federal um, reserve system or community, and can challenge the other stakeholders to get to come together where they may not otherwise choose to do so. <clears throat> when it came to the recognition that there are 12 districts within the Federal Reserve. It begs the question <clears throat> beyond the existing 12 within the continental United States, what happens to the Federal Reserve Bank influence around the world outside the territory United States or continental United States? That district outside the continental United States is, is, is just the de facto 13th district or 13th Federal Reserve. It's just not structured under any particular governing board. It's just an open frontier like, like looking out in space where, if anything, there is a, a real concern that there's more United States currency outside than the United States than than they may like to think. And they're not sure what they, whoever they are, that has influence over those external United States dollars, what they're going to do with those dollars, whether it be China or Russia or India, countries that are hoarding cash may choose to do some very disruptive things with those holdings of US currency. And all that Huda has done as a part of that external 13th Federal Reserve horizon it's beginning to become an influence to say, to say, well, she will represent that district, the role that it plays as a, a passive mirror to the continental 12 districts, to say that that broader horizon outside the territory of the United States can be a balancing force to the whatever turmoil there is within the 12 districts already through debt creation and, and politics as usual. There is a pathway for the, the broader community of US dollar holders outside the United States to come together and, and be a bit more creative. And, and yes, I think the, the idea that the 80th anniversary of the Bretton Woods agreement from 1944 can be a social, um, uh, a, a social window to bring the external United States dollar interest to the back to the table with the United States uh, citizenry being convened not by the US Treasury Secretary, but by the standard bearers to the US Treasury, which are the people that the US Treasury represents, which is they don't represent the banks, the US Treasury represents me the people. So there is a as I see it, a, a, a real transfer of opportunity here in this experiment with the Center for American Studies. For me, the Grand Concordian Jubilee was paying homage to the role that Concord plays at, as, the, as the, the epicenter for the American Revolution, kind of like the, the um, the bright shiny object that catches the eye of the, the cat, like that Concord can bring uh, a greater sensitivity to the table next year by hosting a Jubilee within its own revolutionary timetable as April the 19th, a, a dedicated day for patriotism and so forth, where it can be this, actually ringing the bell for for Jubilee as opposed to um, war and natural disaster as the likely outcome. So there's nothing like a good catastrophe, nothing like a good old war to spend all this money. 
you know, that's, that's, the, that's the sort of prevailing options that may be going on in the idea and the geniuses in the White House. But it could be that they say, well, we have a third option, <clears throat> which is to voluntarily rethink our, um, our, our, our financial correction, a voluntary jubilee, but precipitated by and led by the people of Concord and this Concordian spirit that if the Minutemen started the revolution because they didn't like the tea tax, which was a bit too much to take, maybe the same Minutemen can start to precipitate a withdrawal from um, war and, 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 and man-made disasters. So for me, that's just to put in perspective the, the, the Jubilee, even the idea of a concert of concerts was to use Patriots Day and the, that whole timetable from Patriots Day through to, um, I guess, um, that, that week of activities from Patriots Day, Earth Day, Father Sunday, St. George's Day. There's a whole lot of, I think, pomp and ceremony in Concord around that time that can be, can be sort of returned to look at these broader Concordian that virtues. And music is the currency that for me, I think would be used to, 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 to disarm the, um, the, the sort of whatever, um, uncertain, whatever confusion might be created through, through rhetoric or politics. So having a concert, having a focus on citizenship and <clears throat> to me, I think there's a chance for that, that to be stage managed next year more, more aggressively than was done this year. But this year is a good year to get together and see the groundwork there and see how we can lay out a good, a good timetable for next year's Concordian Jubilee where the spirit of patriotism <clears throat> and Mother Earth and Father Son and Father Time and and of course the the In God We Trust um, anniversary can be can be showcased to to be a lot more um, accessible to people than may have been done in the past. So that's my ten minutes. I hope that you. helps people see where we're coming from and we can go from strength to strength. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you, Corinne, very yes. much. Very much. Um, when we have Ronald, who was called away, he was with us before, Ronald McDowell, an old friend and a new center trustee who, as some of you may know, was Michael Jackson's art teacher and costume designer, and more significantly, his mentor and beloved friend. Ronald has done an extraordinary work on the book called The Kingly Man with Cherie um, Ivy. When they're with us, we'll go into that, how that's related. But I don't wanna do that without their presence. But um, I'd like to go around and invite everybody to consider being with Jay Amaron. And Jay, thank you very much for being with us um, to get feedback on the concert. I wanna move pretty quickly through these agenda points. Um, on the concert of concerts and friends, you're being invited if the spirit moves you to consider number one, whether you can think of a venue for the concert of concerts, whereas for instance, Jay, if in Bangalore, that might be a venue as in Concord and in Bretton Woods. Number two, artists, you know, singers, you know, musicians, storytellers or whatever, they don't have to be just the sung heroes. They can be the unsung. We want all the nations of the world to offer their best and most beloved artists, old, young, as they say, you know, famous, infamous, whatever. So let's just go around and Jay, any thoughts you have on venues, on artists, any thoughts on the concert of concerts? Well, thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Bangalore can be a venue, I'll be happy to arrange and host that. Uh, Bangalore is a happening city and likes to be part of such global uh, movements, if, you, if I may say so. So 
please consider uh, Bangalore as a venue, one of the venues. Thank you, Jay. You're a true brother and trustee. Jay has brought us a number of performers, wonderful performers to our gatherings. Let's go around. Um, Marin, are you there? Can you hear us? Any thoughts on um, venues, on artists, be it again, sung or unsung? Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, well, uh, truth be told, um, uh, it isn't a hat that I typically wear in terms of uh, looking at venues or, or artists, but living here in LA, um, anything can happen. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. I, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to think um, and perhaps get back to you on that. Yeah. The City of the Angels. City of the Angels. <laughs> them all singing together. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you, Marin, and nice to have you with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, glad. Any thoughts from Bermuda on this, if you're with us and can hear? Yes, I, I, I heard the gentleman. I'm not entirely familiar with him. Give indication of a venue. First, I've heard of that venue. I, I don't know if it's in America, uh, India. Where's that venue? Bangalore, India, one of the great cities and cities in southern India. Okay, all right. All right. Uh, I, I guess I'll follow Marin's thread, any venue that can be of a benefit for gathering everybody together. So it's a great venue. At the moment, I can think of one that would be universally embraced right or not but the idea is great and the point is if i can say this is a crescendoing concert it will go on and we hope on and on and i'd love to see having classical musicians like alexander romanel who is with us in this last gathering and hip-hop all of the genre of music, sung heroes, unsung heroes, young and old, all as labors of love to bring about the redemption of our financial system and to address poverty and hunger and thirst and lack of shelter. So it'd be wonderful to do something in the Bermuda Triangle, Glad and Corinne. By all means, now, Cassandra, again, as a word, you're talking about in the sense of what you're saying in the context is you're saying annually or it, annually. It will be ongoing. We're looking to, which means it doesn't have to be perfect and final and, and superb. It's going to be ongoing. We're looking to July 4th. We're looking to September 29th. So crescendoing, it, it gathers, it gathers, it gathers, it gathers. Do you have an example? Um, I don't know if there have been, does anybody know if there's been crescendoing concerts? Um, you know, we have the Live Aid One, um, but I see this as ongoing. And I think that it'll attract more and more artists as the word gets out, it will have the potential to really resound. Jay, any thoughts? You've come back into the picture. Well, it'll be the first of its kind, Stuart. So uh, it's not easy to explain it to Glad, but uh, Glad Crescendoing is that we keep improving and including more people. Yeah. Thank you. That helps. When, when you opened the meeting, I couldn't help Stuart by reflecting on some of the things that were emanating. One that stood out to me is that, you know, the more things change, they remain the same. Um, and it, it would be great if we can start to move out of 
what I would look at or frame as, as a rat race sort of scenario where we can finally, as people stop chasing our tails, you know, that, that just jumped out at me as I was listening to you reflect on utterances from out of the past from people of, 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 of depth as they related to that time and how this time is reminiscent of that time. You know, I, I just felt to have to say that. And, and I want to thank you, Corin, for that framework you laid. It, it, it was clear and concise. It, 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 it indicated that there's a lot involved and in what stood out as you were manifesting your thoughts is that you have a firm handle on what has evolved in the midst of this experience that we're having here with the Center of American Studies. You know, so um, I'm encouraged by your grasp of what is unfolding amongst us. Thank you, Vlad. Friend, Susan has finished her interview. Susan, can you give us any thoughts on a new national anthem? We have the original anthem, Hail Columbia. Columbia being up to the 19th century, the literary poetic oratorical name for America, the District of Columbia, Hail Columbia, the Columbia Tammany Society, which then was superseded by the Star Spangled Banner, um, which has overt racist, stunningly racist allusions in it. And we've asked Susan, who's part Native American and who's a very gifted um, musician and um, singer, if she might consider as her schedule allows, composing, working with us to compose, but leading the way a new national anthem that perhaps if it gets that far, we can introduce at our gathering on the 4th of July. Susan, any comments? Thank you. And I, I'm so uh, honored to, <laughs> to be asked to do this. Um, I used to uh, work with the composers at New England Conservatory. I would always be the one that people would come to to premiere their pieces um, as a conductor, sometimes as a flutist or singer or all three. <laughs> and so I've got some ideas. We have such a rich and strange history here in America with so many different cultures. And you know, my, my thoughts are, how do we combine all of those in the lyrics? but also in the music and, um, and also how do we make it exciting and rousing and a patriotic song, right? Something that allows us to have um, some pride in the history, even as we all suffer from the history. How do we acknowledge the suffering and somehow get to pride from it? Uh, it's, it's, a dilemma, um, and any of you who have ideas on it, um, I'm welcome. I welcome them. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I think it's time we had a new national anthem beyond bombs bursting in air. And I love, and I love to see friends, though it is center trustees and valued advisors like Glad and Corinne. I'd love to see that we could offer that. The Center for American Studies at Concord could author, offer a new national anthem that really does justice to our aspiring United States. Further comments, Susan, from your side? Um, I just appreciate, Stuart, how much you treasure and appreciate each person, each very different individual that you hold in your floral, your human floral arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jay, you've emerged again. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your words. Jay, anything you wish to add? I wanted to suggest that um, 
if you put out this project on the website that you would like to uh, recraft a new national anthem, you will get thousands of people writing to you. And that is one way to involve many people. And then of course, you will come up with many alternatives. That can be another crescendoing moment. Beautiful. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Let's continue around. So please be thinking of performers. Susan, you know many performers. Um, I want to come to my brother, Andrew. Andrew, anything you wish to offer on venues for this concert of concert on performers, on any thoughts at all? You're on mute, Andrew, at least for me. Uh, not at this time, except to encourage the continuation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Dear Huda, if you're with us still, any thoughts from your side? Do you know any Ethiopian singers, performers in your great sacred city? I will, I will reach out and get back to you next time, next meeting. Could you, thank you. Could you imagine Hurrah hosting one of the concerts? I, yes, I do actually. If that's not too American, too Western? Um, Hurrah is, um, is, Hurrah is just Hurrah. It's got its own heartbeat. Um, and, I mean, I think of Hurrah as a, as a drum beat. Um, it's, that's just one of the events. Hurrah is just known to have its own events. Uh, it's, it doesn't take too much to turn Hurrah into a party zone, but it's not a, in a Western way. Um, it's, it's a party zone that you don't mind having your children at. It's a family event. So, Huda, can you just say a bit about Hurrah, your home city? It's a significant city in Ethiopia. Can you fill people in a little bit? I think it'd be wonderful to have a concert there, our crescendoing concert there. I think it would be too. Um, it's the city of the Queen of Sheba, is it? It is. It's Queen of Sheba's castle, the Walden City. Um, I'm actually surprised there hasn't been an event done in Harar at the scale because it is so easy to turn Harar into an event center, it's, it's just, it's already laid out that way. Wonderful. Well, rumor has it you have a brother who's a sultan. Perhaps you could broach the idea with the book, The Kingly Man, which we'll talk about next time. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Huda. And dear Elaine, a trustee now of quite a few years, a quiet one from the heartland. Any thoughts, Elaine, from your side about this concert of concerts crescendoing? Can you hear me? Now we hear you. Uh, I didn't know if I had my mute on or off. Um, actually, no. I really don't have any musical connections or preferences. Do you think we could get you to do a soft shoe? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I may ask you again, though, Elaine. Anyways, thank you. Thank you. So let's move. So, friends, be thinking, if you will of performers, of venues, of how we can have this eternally crescendoing concert. 
the celebration, the sung heroes, the Paul McCartney's, the, the James Taylor's, the Patti Smith's, the, the Martha Reeves, the unsung, the old, the young, classical, all sorts of music. Please be thinking about that and feel free to offer any thoughts. I want to um, pick up, I want to touch on a, an item now. Jay, would you give us the update? Your, your initiative to address cybercrime is now on our website. Can you just fill in with folks um, where that stands? And then I, was, I want to ask Andrew to talk about his initiative on behalf of Nigeria. We're not a complete circle of trustees, but we're doing the best we can with all the challenges we have. Uh, <clears throat> just for those who are not aware, uh, Stuart had guided us on a project called the Earth Scouts Program, which was targeting the students of uh, the middle school in India. So the same group has now taken up this project to promote uh, awareness of uh, using rigorous passwords for their uh, online interface with the um, uh, world. And in that sense, um, cybercrime is a major, major challenge for us. In 2020, we lost a trillion dollars. In the following year, we lost six trillion dollars, which is too big an amount to be neglected. And so we said we'll address this challenge by helping people to use more rigorous passwords and change them frequently. So that is the progress. Uh, we're working school by school and any school who signs up for this program soon becomes a, what's called a safe school. So that's the progress from my side. And can you describe how it's connected for those, Jay, with the center now? Yeah, the center provides um, a certification that uh, the program is uh, uh, world class and uh, it's a certified program. So, center provides the um, status of uh, a program that has been, you know, filtered and curated and certified. So, that's the role of the center. Thank you. And Jay has done it such a way as a center trustee of quite a few years now, so that it can generate potentially a significant in income stream for the center as well. Um, so thank you, Jay, very much. Andrew, would you, we're, and again, we're not a complete complement of trustees, but would you speak about your initiative around Nigeria so people have it in present in mind? And then when we, have more of our trustees together, we can go into it at greater length. Well, briefly, but I would need to bring up my other computer, my device <laughs> to walk you through it. So if you would give me a, about five minutes, I'll come back in on my other device. Thank you. I'll be right back. Great. So friends, while we're, while we're waiting, um, there's been an important development in Jay. I'd like to call it to your attention in particular and that is the Center for American Studies has under our programs on the last link, something called the Global Village University. And the Global Village University has about 80 individuals, very gifted individuals who are part of either the advisory circle or the curriculum that is the faculty. And that's only about a quarter of those who've, who've actually expressed interest. We just haven't, the person who had center site for this um, is no longer involved. So we've been waiting to take up this thread anew. But basically what we're offering, and then Andrew, I'll go back to you. What we're offering is a degree from high school through postgraduate in the cutting edge field of not the physical, natural, social, or cognitive sciences, the brain bound cognitive sciences, but the spiritual sciences. And what we're suggesting is as it wasn't until about the 1960s that the cognitive sciences appeared on the scene, that is this, this 
striving of science, of science, of knowledge began in the physical realm and then it spread out into the natural realm and it spread out into the social realm and it spread out into the cognitive realm, unfortunately using the same reductionistic methodology. So the way we approach minerals, we approached the natural world, reducing it to its heap of flesh and bones, the social world, the cognitive sciences being brain bound and materialistic. The next step we're suggesting, which the center is helping to pioneer are the spiritual sciences. And this is not a reductionistic approach. This is the opposite. So in our village university, we have a degree offering anywhere from high school students to post doctorate in the emerging field of the spiritual sciences. We have one of the finer small college faculties or collegiums in the country, if not further afield. And you can see this on our link under programs, the last link. Um, this is fully accredited. It doesn't need to cost a penny if the students don't have the resources because the faculty or the collegium are individuals who understand how critical it is to get education to the people of the world. So they're not in it to make a living. A number of them are emeritus. Um, and in fact, this vision was inspired by three constituencies, Native Americans, Africans, not African Americans, but Africans, and no one's excluded, and then prisoners. So it was work with these three constituencies, prisoners, Africans, and Native Americans that inspired this program, which once again, to repeat, offers a deg degree, fully accredited degree in the emerging field of the spiritual sciences with one of the finer small college faculties or collegiums in the nation, if not further afield, that doesn't need to cost a penny. And through our network, the center's circle of friends or concordium, if the students are serious, virtually guarantees them not just a job, but a calling. That is, the, all the collegium members have to do is to say to us, this student I've had is really a serious student. And then we'll reach out to our circle of friends that, that includes you all, but ranges also from, as I've said before, the former prime minister of Greece, Andonis Samaras, a dear old friend to Travis Henry, a janitor who's working as decisively in other corridors of power. So we are gonna be gearing this up. There's growing interest in it. And I, Jay, called it to your attention because I don't want to be simp overly simplistic, but we'd, we're planning to have a planning circle to get this moving again and to have representatives, two representatives of the five major races. For simplicity's sake, white, red, black, brown, and yellow, two representatives for about two or three meetings, planning meetings. It's not gonna take a lot of time to make sure we're really united as we move forward. Jay, did you wanna say something? You, you have had one more color, and that is peach for the Muslim world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, I will follow up on that. So Jay, um, I haven't, we haven't been able to speak, but I'd like to ask if you would, um, join that circle for two or three meetings. It's a really remarkable cast of characters to really bring together what, what's on our website and to see if we are all in accord and then we will begin. Sure. Thank you. Count me. Thank you very much. So friends, all of you are invited to join that collegium that faculty, which means to offer a degree in this emerging field of the spiritual sciences. You don't need to be experts. 
you need to simply out of your own genius, grasp what it's about, what it's striving to do, um, which is to bring together the heavens and the earth, which is to bring together science and spirit. So I'm gonna bring up on the screen share um, a picture here so you can see what we've done thus far. Um, one moment. And all of you are invited, if the spirit moves you, to consider offering a degree from high school to postgraduate, depending on where your education is. Can you all see these pictures, friends? Yep. So here we have our circle of advisors, Patch Adams on the far left, and there's Jay with whom we've just been speaking. It's a remarkable cast of characters. Um, Bill Ferris is a former founder of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and chairman of the National Endowment of Humanities. There's Arun Gandhi, who as you all may have heard, passed away just four days ago, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi a member of our honor circle of trustees. I spoke about Doug George Cantanillo, who's right here on the third below on the far left. Doug um, is one of the original, he's a trustee of the Center for American Studies and one of the original trustees of the Smithsonian Native American Museum. Um, it's a remarkable cast of characters. Here we have Daniel McCannon, who's a Holds the Emerson Chair at the Harvard Divinity School. Bernard Lafayette, who Dr. King gave the mandate on the eve of his assassination to institute nonviolence globally. Mia Pakachnik, um, Slovenia's um, cultural ambassador, Matt Patsky, one of the fathers of social responsible investing, and on and on. Dennis Taylor, the editor of the Journal for Art and Literature, who's with us for the 4th of July, and Ian Trousdale, who spoke with us, Mangalam Srinivasan, an advisor to Indira Gandhi. These are the advisors. And then we have the collegium members, of which you all are invited to take part. And um, this is also a remarkable cast of characters. So what the individuals do is they I'll give you an example here. So here's Bruce Kirshaw, who's part of the planning circle. And Bruce was, was um, nominated as the University of North Carolina's Teacher of the Year. So you all are invited if you wish to offer a degree, put your name, put a picture, and what your background is and what your course would be. Bruce has used the term parts and holes, I in the world. Every sincere man is right, or to make him right, only needs a little larger dose of his own personality, Emerson. And then Bruce says, there's only one course, only one path, only one degree, and that is what I strive to teach. If this is a path you seek, I'm here to help, and will accompany you on your way. There is no fee, though you should anticipate expenses. There's an entrance exam, write a one word, followed by one sentence, followed by one paragraph, followed by one page introduction to the degree as you see it and send it to me at this address. I will let you know if you've been accepted or if prior work is necessary. If you are accepted, I'll provide more details. You can find out about me from the following resources, but they'll do you little good. If you think that this is a course about me, this is not the course you are for you. Look rather into your own heart and envision the degree that your spirit calls you to. So this is obviously a thoughtful kindred spirit, but an accomplished biologist and the University of North Carolina's Teacher of the Year. So you all friends are invited to consider whether you're at the phase in your life when you'd like to offer the fruits of your work to others in this format. We'll be advertising extensively this offering. People will come to it. 
So to go back, they'll come to it, they'll find their way to these photos and I will catch theirs. They'll check, they'll do research and then they reach out to you. There are no middlemen, there are no deans, there's no faculty chairs. None of that gets in the way. Individuals see your pictures, they read about you, they contact you, you make arrangements. How, how the course will be, how the degree will be offered, what, it, what cost, if any, there will be, all of these details you handle. What we do together is we share from our collective experience. That's what we do together. And by the way, if you can see, is that one of the center trustees I'd mentioned, Brian Lynch, who's had Parkinson for 30 years. This is another center trustee who recently passed away. This is Ronald McDowell, our center trustee, Michael Jackson's art teacher. Um, so this is, this is Claire who was speaking to us earlier tonight. Um, this is Patrick Wallace, who's a great, great grandson of the founder of Tuskegee, a center trustee who's just had brain surgery. So for you all to consider, I don't wanna make it too long tonight, but you all are invited to join this collegium. And the way we put it to make it very simple, you will determine the degree you'll offer. High school, postgraduate. We're not gonna second guess you. Those we've invited to be part of the collegium, we're not gonna second guess. There are no deans and no faculty chairs. We're not gonna second guess you. If you determine after one hour, you know, to exaggerate to make the point, if you determine after one hour that someone is qualified to receive a postdoctorate degree. Well, you know, we'll be interested in your reasoning, but um, the winds of freedom blow through this initiative. So with that, let me pause and ask if there are any questions, any thoughts, friends, in terms of this initiative of the Center for American Studies for which you all are trustees or valued advisors. Any comments, and then we'll turn to Andrew. And yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, this is the second time I've heard you mentioned it. This is a bit more comprehensive than the last time because you just mentioned it and asked what we like to be a participant. Um, how long has this, in natural fact, been an initiative? It's been an initiative for three years, but not there have been a number of the, of the of the collegium members who've been holding courses, but it really hasn't geared up yet because the person who had center site ended up stepping back. And when that happens, I don't just sort of push things. I wait to see, okay, someone has stepped back. Let's see when the time is right for it to come together again. And now we have students that are asking of it, inquiring. So that's what's leading for it to pick up again. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments, friends? Could you envision Susan offering a degree yourself? That would be welcome. I'm sorry? That would be welcome, Susan. I don't know, Susan, are you with us, Susan? You're on mute. You're on mute. You're on mute, Susan. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button quickly enough. <laughs> so that, that's wonderful. And of course, I have much to say and much to do about that. We need to, for example, relearn history, right? Learn more about the uh, indigenous side of all of our histories from all over the world. Look to our ancestors. Often we've been cut off from our ancestry, our various ancestries. Um, and for that, have lost so much know-how, knowing the plants and the animals and the climate and all sorts of things we've lost. And so 
what I'd like to do is try to recover what's lost to us that we need in order to survive into the future. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Any other comments about this, Corinne? Yeah, Have you yeah, had Corinne. thoughts about what you might offer a degree? Well, I, I was curious, are these current academic credentials sort of transferable? So if someone gets like a, a good degree from the center, does that get them credit with say MIT or some other university? We are working with a number of universities. Um, if you go under on the link at the website under accreditation, you'll see approaching it. But essentially, the accredited degree is accredited in a number of regards through affiliations with other degree granting institutions, number one. Number two, it's accredited the same way Harvard and Yale. Uh, can't hear you so voice. Can't hear you so voice. <laughs> muffled. We can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Okay, hang on. I it came back. Can you hear me? Yes. So it's accredited in the following regards. Number one, it's accredited the way Harvard, Yale, Smith, Vassar accredited, was accredited. That is that they believed in themselves and they accredited themselves, number one. And they didn't force anybody to come to them. They believed in themselves and the conquered spirit of self-reliance. They accredited themselves and they didn't force anybody to accept it. They could freely choose, number one. Number two, we are working with institutions like Empire College, where we have relationships, and there'll be more and more who understand what we're doing and will grant, in that respect, um, credit for what we, for, for the, for the, what we offer in terms of our, our degrees. The interesting situation we're in is that since this is in the emerging field of the spiritual sciences and enlightened common sense of fully realized science, there's actually no one who can accredit us because we're on the cutting edge. So, you know, even if we were to sort of be obedient and say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna be accredited by some outer sources, because we don't believe enough in ourself or we wanna be politically correct or we wanna be quote acceptable, there's really no institutions out there in a substantive way that are on this cutting edge the way we are in America. There is a whole field of the spiritual sciences in Europe. It's called the Geisteswissenschaften, which means literally spiritual sciences but they are not appropriate to accredit how we're working it with it out of the gene out of the genius of the West. So um, that's the approach to accreditation. I won't take a lot of time on it. We go into it at more length and have done a lot of due diligence there. I think there are going to be more and more institutions. Um, there's a real revolution going on in education where the doors are opening and the old status quo is breaking down. I think we can be in the forefront. And maybe the last thing I'll note, this, the last thing I'll note is during the American Revolution when Harvard College was occupied by the continental troops, Harvard College moved to Concord and held classes in Concord. So Concord was, if you will, the superior partner in that relationship. And Harvard College was the inferior partner in that relationship. So there is an interesting precedent here 
And indeed, Emerson said that our disciplines today, without that primary faculty of intuition, become but tuitions. It's just something you pay. And when Thoreau was asked about Harvard, and he went to Harvard, he, they were talking about all the many branches of learning. With all due respects, he said, yes, many branches, but how about, are there any roots? Does it go deep? So we're not apologizing to anybody. We have connections with Harvard and MIT and Brandeis and Boston University and Boston College. We've worked with them all, but we've worked with them on our terms. And every summer at the gatherings of the Thoreau Society and the Emerson Society and the Fuller Society and so on, we meet many academics, many celebrated academics. Probably half the membership of the Thoreau, Emerson and other societies are academics, but they're sort of transcendental ac academics. They understand what we're doing. They understand what we're trying to pioneer. So there's more and more understanding and appreciation and, and good many of them are becoming involved in our degree offering. So again, I apologize for going on as much, but I wanted to give as full a picture as possible. So back to Corin, you had said your mom had said you should be teaching. Could you envision offering a degree? Well, again, yeah, she thought, uh, yeah, yeah, she, she is very keen. I was supposed to go to MIT and it was a big drama back in the day. So this is bringing me back to the, that, that, that journey. But with, 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 so let's say that Trump University is given degrees, you know, or, or selling degrees. What would differentiate, or, or, that, or, or I've seen like different sort of churches and they have their own sort of um, degree schools, so to speak. With, is, are the levels of scrutiny over how degrees are um, promoted or marketed or I, I, accreditation to me means that the, you get recognition, different levels of accredit, I guess, acceptance of the academic credentials. Is it the case that C, the, C, the Center for American Studies already has a sort of a, a certain standard uh, in the academic arena that it is at par in, in public domain, like it's not, it's at par with Harvard or is it something that it's, it's not yet, doesn't even entertain that kind of comparison between an institution that charges an arm and leg for an education or degree and, 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 and sort of fortifies it in the public arena versus these more sort of academic credentials of convenience. Yeah, so to Corinne, um, how do you manage that? So we, are, we, we really have worked with all these institutions. Stanley Cavell, who is the chairman of Harvard's philosophy department and a great Emersonian scholar, was a member of our honorary circle of trustees, as was Howard Zinn, as was Leo Marx, the father of American studies and on and on and on. So we've worked with these institutions. At our Patriots Day gathering, Dennis Taylor, Professor Emeritus from Boston College and editor of the Journal of Art and Literature, he spoke about this Concordian conversation. We have these connections because they're kindred spirits and Concordians in all of these institutions. And Concord is Concord. But we're not playing the game and we're not forcing anybody to take our courses. And we recognize that a lot of people get degrees because they want to get a job. They want to get a job. And we have the network in our concordium in our circle of friends, as they said, from Greece's former prime minister to this genial janitor, Travis Henry. And the professions across the board as diverse as we are diverse we can make connections in job references. Jay has helped countless young students. So we're forcing nobody to take our degree. We're not apologizing. We're not explaining ourselves. There's no one who can accredit us because we're in the cutting edge field of the spiritual science out of the genius of this land. 
And we're just working collaboratively, but we're doing it in the conquered spirit. That is, we answer to nobody but to our own conscience. Does that make sense, friends? Elaine, I'd love to hear from you, who's been with us for quite a while now. What thoughts do you have on that? I am quiet tonight. Well, you're quiet many a night, dear sister. Well, I generally... <clears throat> Elaine has been asked to give a degree with a former trustee with whom Elaine and I were very close for she to work with Richard Kotlars to offer a degree which she's thinking about anyways I won't I won't um, call on you unduly but Corinne did the foregoing answer your question at all Yeah, that helped. I, I, I'm, I'm clear. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. I got you. It's really all about the relationship between the teachers and the students. And if the students don't feel that the teachers can give them what they seek, nothing will unfold. So it's all about the human connections, the destiny, the destiny connections. In any case, I don't want to extend this too long, but we have um, now 10, nine representatives of the red, black, yellow, white, and brown races. And now we have to add the pink. So Jay, thank you very much. And that group of approximately 12 to 13 will meet for two or three meetings to go over the presentation I showed you all the link on our website under programs to do the due, <laughs> diligence, the due diligence and we welcome any thoughts you all may have and then it'll be launched officially and the main challenge and this is where people like Andrew and others can help will be to get the word out because there are a lot of people like Jean from Haiti who can't afford an education has so much to give the world just needs a break. And that's what this is about. Initially with Native Americans, prisoners and Africans, but for any and everybody. Yeah, I, I favor the initiative, Stuart. I mean, as we listen to one and once, we are listening for context and clarity and of course as we exchange we we stand better chance of understanding that much more clearly as, as i'm listening to you talk i'm here in bermuda and here in bermuda education is in a shambles i mean <laughs> it's 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 very interesting to watch you know they've had all kinds of high-end experts come in and the, the more they pursue improvement the, the worse it tends to get you say something andrew no i no i didn't okay i said all that just to say that you know you have my attention in this approach because what's happening here in Bermuda, they're grappling with all kinds of things. And like I said, the more they do so, the less confidence they seem to display in grasping what they need to do to improve things. Um, so it's interesting. Well, glad- So Andrew, you ready? I'm so glad just to say briefly, so with there, this could go in many directions. This is how we're supporting Jay's work, having been asked by the prime minister to address cybercrime. So this is how educationally we're supporting Jay, Jay's work. While I hadn't thought of it until you brought up tonight, perhaps with your and Corin's input, we could offer something that could serve the Bermuda educational system. You know, 
either individual students or maybe even you know grades or 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 schools. Who knows? It's unlimited the possibilities. Um, it's all going to arise out of individual initiative. What what comes to people's minds? Jay, you appeared for a moment. Any thoughts you want to add? I want to suggest that we can work with the Bermuda. Uh, there is a grant available from the World Bank for this. And uh, I happen to know the person who's administering the grant here. Wonderful. Great. Jay holds a record at the World Bank when he was there, um, working with the president of the World Bank for the most deals done in a month. He's a consummate juggler who's open to needs from all sides and does his very best, sometimes going 100 miles an hour to, um, to be of service. So thank you, Jay. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other comments on this, friends, this, this degree offering before we go to Andrew? And then I want to wrap up with the citizens movement and then we'll conclude the evening. Any other comments on this educational aspect? We, can we follow up with Jay, please? To... Say it again, Puda. Yeah, Jacob, I, I would love to follow up with you um, in, yeah. in terms of you know, figuring out how to align funding for various projects. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's connect on. Okay. Um, so, I'll, I'll I'll write my number down. You want to put in the chat, Huda? Yes. Great. Any other f comments, friends, before we go to Andrew and then draw this to a conclusion tonight? Then Andrew, um, again, we're not a complete compliment. We did have four other trustees who were with us, but had pressing matters. We had Ronald McDowell, who was with us in the beginning, but then had to slip off. We had Bino La Montaigne, who just got off, uh, finished with an operation. He was out of circulation for a while. Um, we had Marin, who was with us. And who was the other one who was with us earlier? It'll come to me, but um, yeah, Andrew, do you want to do you want to bring us bring forward um, your initiative? And at the next meeting, I trust we'll have more trustees to hear about it. Well, if I may share my screen, I will be happy to walk you through it briefly. Okay, I'm going to let you do that right now. One second. Um, Okay, should be up, should be set now. Yes, it is. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and <clears throat> for most of you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for most <clears throat> for most of you, you may or may not have received this in the email that I sent out last week. <clears throat> but I <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just walk through this briefly. And for any additional information, of course, I'm available to it. I apologize. This is all text but I'll read it to you. I do have videos, et cetera, but I'll just walk through this to get it on the record. So let, me, let, me, let me just say here, I, I can imagine that Jay, Jay may have some thoughts here, Andrew. Okay. Well, as I said, I'll walk through it. Um, this is a 2023 SAGA project in Nigeria. SAGA is an acronym for the Shola Agula Goodwill Ambassador Foundation is based in Lagos, Nigeria. It was founded in Ju on June the 23rd of 2020, 2020. It was found by Shola Agula, who had been appointed as my Goodwill Ambassador of Five Points Youth Foundation several years earlier. And he took my recommendation to start his own foundation because for many years he had been president of the Nigerian, <coughs> excuse me, Nigerian Association for Young Adults in Canada and the, and the United States. And during that period of time from 2013 until 2020, he had delivered 
over $100 million worth of medical and educational equipment and supplies that were donated by the government of Canada through his organization to all parts of Nigeria and also to, in, uh, to Kenya and India. This shipment here is the second one of this year. The first one was done in December, but it was just delivered about a month ago. And this is under its own banner, the Shola Agbula Goodwill Ambassador Association. Now, every year, the or twice a year, the government of Canada, they, <clears throat> uh, they are forced by their regulations to replace uh, equipment with the most highly developed equipment. In other words, uh, the equipment becomes obsolete, even though it's in complete good working condition, their rules and regulations force them to get the most advanced version of whatever material or equipment it is. So this has resulted, as I said, in millions of dollars of equipment being made available. And what the Saga Foundation does is it raises the money for just the freight charge for the shipment from Canada to Nigeria. In this case, uh, this shipment, I believe, is about $7 million, and the cost is about $30,000. They originally had uh, been offered this three, two months ago, uh, but Saga Foundation at that time did not have the funds. One of my other associates uh, stepped up to say that they would want to facilitate this shipment because they had um, another country that they wanted to receive the sim similar material, but they understood that this one had to be done first. However, after we were able to reactivate the shipment, they decided not to proceed. So now this shipment is being, um, well, it's in risk of, of reverting back to Canada if we don't get the freight paid by in the next couple of weeks. But I'll walk you through this. And this again is presented by Ambassador Shola Agbula, the founder and CEO of the Saga Foundation, and myself, Andrew Williams Jr. I'm the chairperson of their International Advisory Board. Project justification. The COVID-19 pandemic has overwhelmed health systems in both developed and developing nations alike. Africa has one of the weakest health systems globally. So while many advanced countries have started recovering from the effects of COVID-19, the majority of African countries still continue to struggle with the devastating effects of the pandemic that further exacerbated poverty levels in Africa. Therefore, Saga Foundation continues to work with communities, leaders, and stakeholders to help break the cycle of poverty in developing nations through access to education, sanitation, water, and quality health care. The description of this project. The project is the second healthcare project for Saga Foundation in Nigeria. The location of this project is in in Osun State, Nigeria. This is a 40 feet medical equipment and supplies container aimed to help Osun State to promote access to primary care and to improve health outcomes for the community. Our belief is that this will have positive impacts in the lives of ordinary citizens living in Eid. Most importantly, this project will have the following impacts. Improving affordable healthcare delivery in Nigeria by do donating essential hospital equipment and supplies from Canada to support local hospitals. Getting a consistent improvement in our healthcare delivery system in Nigeria and be updated with the modern global medical trends especially in the areas of knowledge capacity, building, and technological advancement. And finally, regular support and assistance in all areas of healthcare delivery systems towards ensuring an efficient and effective healthcare system in Nigeria. The kinds of equipment available. The shipment is usually a 40-foot container containing all kinds of hospital equipment and supplies that may include, among others, large hospital equipment, x-ray scans, et cetera, apparatus and hospital furnishing, cardiac machines, gastrointestinal needs, laboratory supplies, IV supplies, obstetrics and gynecological supplies, orthopedic supplies, ear, nose, <coughs> excuse me, eye, ear, nose, and throat hospital needs, patient care hospital supplies, pediatric supplies, surgical needs, syringes and needles, urology supplies, 
respiratory supplies, uniforms and gowns, hospital dressings, converters, drapes, beddings, and curtains. The process, Saga Foundation receives application from various communities and evaluates the application for completeness and whether they meet the standard or not. Project funding, because this project is aimed at helping poor communities, it is completely delivered free of charge. The funding for the project is usually self-funded or sometimes funded through sponsorship through other charity organizations. The funding costs, A, <clears throat> cost for, for shipment from Winnipeg, Canada to the port of entry, 11,680. Cost from receiving port to receiving facility, $10,000. Purchasing a container, uh, 4,000. Cost of customs brokerage, $2,500. Total cost for professional loading, et cetera, $1,850 for a total cost of $30,000 and $30,030. The amount that Saga is looking for is $20,030. So the shipping company is um, Not Flox Associate Shipping in Springfield, Manitoba. This is the same company that's previously shipped. Uh, a container, so they're well respected and we've done business with them before. Um, what does the recipient hospital have to do? Answer and return the attached questionnaire to Saga Foundation, fill out a project request form for Saga Foundation, and when approved, a comprehensive inventory list and memorandum of understanding document will be sent to the recipient hospital. Both documents must be filled and returned at the stipulated date. When equipment and supplies are ready to be shipped, the recipient hospital will be notified and must be prepared for the clearing of the container. Photographs of the arrival of the container and offloading are essentials. Successful past projects by Ambassador Shola Agbula. From 2013 to date, we have donated over $250 million worth of hospital equipment and supplies in Africa and Asia, as well as educational supplies. In 2013, a 40-foot container of medical equipment and supplies to Batubu Mabesi, State Hospital in Emo State, Nigeria. Uh, 2014, a uh, 40 foot container to medical equipment and supplies, Zuru Kabi State, Nigeria, distributed to seven hospitals. 2015, 20 foot additional container of medical supplies to Zuru Kabi State, Nigeria, for more hospitals. 2015, 40 foot container of medical supplies to Bayelsa State Hospital in Niger Delta, Delta State, Nigeria. 2016, 40 foot container of medical equipment and supplies to the Osun State Hospital in Iwo, Usun State. 2017, 40 foot container of medical supplies and equipment to several hospitals in o o Ogun State through Olus Olusogun Obasanjo Foundation. And I'm wrapping up here now. 2019, 40 foot container to uh, Madonna Hospital in uh, Yumahaya, Abia State, Nigeria. 2019, 40 foot container to Niger, uh, Bida, Niger State, Nigeria. 2020, medical equipped 40 feet container to Kisumu Medical Center in Kenya. 2020, supplies, medical supplies to Kazazuri Medical Center in Kazazuri, Jigawa State, in Nigeria. 2021, 40 foot container of medical supplies to Society of the Holy Spirit in Mumbai, India. And 2023, a uh, 40-foot container of medical supplies to Ila, Oregon, and Usun State, Nigeria. The qualitative educational program. We have also contributed significantly to improving quality education in Nigeria through our Education for All initiative by no donating thousands of science, engineering, mathematics, and other important textbooks to major Nigerian universities, as well as hundreds of free laptop computers to the following schools. In 2013, 900 volumes of university tech uh, books to two universities in Bayelsa State. 2015, 100 computers complete system to Zuru, Kebi State. 2015, 1,200 volumes of university and high school books to Zuru, Kebi State. 2015, two school projectors donated to Zuru, Kebi State. 2015, 400 volumes of university books and a projector to Federal University of Technology. Oweri and Umu Aimu State. 2015, 700 volumes of high school books to secondary schools in Abo Mabesi, Eno State. 2016, 50 laptop computers to Bowen University, Iwo Usun State. 
2016, 50 laptop computers to Osun State University, Osu, Osu, Osagbo, and Osun State. 2017, 500 volumes of university textbooks to University of, Abu, of Abuja. 2017, 600 volumes of university books to Veritas University in Abuja. 2017, 400 volumes of university of books of Federal Polytechnic and Nekadi Oweri, Imo State. 2017, 700 volumes to the Federal University of Technology Oweri in Imo State. 2017, hundreds of textbooks to Ila Orungo College of Education in Osun State. 2019, 15 computers complete systems to secondary schools in Mobutu, Abu Babesi, Imo State. 2019, 20,000 pieces of clothing to rural men and women in Ila Orungu, Osun State. 2019, over 25,000 pieces of clothing to rural men and women in Oba Ili, Usun State. And 2019, 500 volumes of university books to Gregory University, Oturu, and Abe State. So this is signed by both Shola Agbula, uh, the founder, and myself, Ambassador Andrew Williams, Jr. So uh, thank you so very much, Stuart, and the members here of the Center for American Studies for Concord for allowing me to share this project that could be replicated in other countries as soon as we finish this one. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Jay, you of all of us gathered, you have the most experience. Any thoughts you could offer? Well, <clears throat> let me get the uh, proposal that um, was shown to us, and I will see who can come forward to support it. Thank you, Jay, so very much. Yeah, but just email me that, uh, that four page, whatever you showed us. Excellent, I'll do that as soon as we get off here. Thank you. Thank you, friends. It's getting late. I'd like to draw this to an end with much appreciation by just mentioning the last initiative. Mm -hmm. And that is that I will be stepping forward and inviting others to join me, many others. In my case, as a standard bearer, standard being like a flag and placeholder for constitutional president of the United States for America. Again, nothing more than a standard bearer or placeholder. What's meant by that? And I'm calling upon many, many fellow citizens to join me. What's meant in my case, everybody have to speak for themselves, is to hold a place, a realm, a sacred space for we the people to find its voice and to come to expression in the spirit in service to public service, which means that the 11th hour, I would expect to and look forward to handing over that standard, that flag and that place to someone who is destined, I don't see myself destined as stepping into such an office, be it a Bobby Kennedy with whom I'm in regular touch or whoever. So what we're saying will be, inaugurating this more officially on the 4th of July, we had words or presentations by Dennis Kucinich, by Tulsi Gabbard, greetings by Bobby Kennedy on, the, on Patriot's Day, Chris Crawford, who ran for treasurer in Massachusetts, Libertarian Party, Jill Stein wrote beautiful words, a Green Party presidential candidate, representative of the Constitution Party, is we are inaugurating the citizens movement to revive the spirit of public service. That is the work of the Center for American Studies and with that I bring this to an end, is to bring new civilization or civilized impulses into all spheres of society. New civilization or civilized impulses into all spheres of society. One of the most vital one is politics or public service. And so I'm suggesting, I'll be suggesting more formally on the 4th of July to my fellow Massachusetts citizens who've run for office 
And I think there are probably a half a million in this country in the last election or two who ran for office, who didn't get the majority of the votes and concluded that they lost. Whereas you can't lose when you give it your best and you're committed to public service. So that's what we're doing. We're stepping forward. We're saying, I am and inviting others instead of saying, if I'm elected, give me your time, give me your money, give me your energy, give me your hopes, give me your vote. And if I'm elected, I'll do A, B, and C. If not, see you later, folks. I'm out of here. Instead of saying that, just do it. Don't talk the talk, walk the talk, just serve. Assume the mantle, the constitutional mantle of the office that you feel called for and serve without a lot of expectations, without a lot of hoopla, just serve, just serve. And if you meet real needs, you'll become newsworthy. You'll get the publicity and with the publicity will come the funds and you don't need to cozy up to anybody. You don't need to cozy up to editors. You don't need to cozy up to funders, just serve. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And we're gonna be inaugurating as part of this, not campaign, but celebration, a seminar for the whole new generation of public servants, not Democrats or Republicans or independents or Green Party members or Libertarians, but those who understand the vision of the citizens movement to revive the spirit of public service. So I hope all of you will consider being part of that faculty as well. Who did, who did to speak of the grand Concordian Jubilee? Corinne to speak of um, the genius of St. Michael, Susan of your work, everybody here has something to offer. I believe that there are many, many people that want to make a difference, feel called to public service, aren't happy with the party apparatus, but don't know that there are any alternatives. And I think we have an alternative to offer. So that's how we are seeking to bring new civilization and civilized impulses into the realm of public service. We'll go into that at more length next time. Andrew and I have had a very fruitful day along these lines today. Any final questions there before I read the concluding verse and we all get a good night's sleep? We will go into this more fully next time, but any, for the moment, any questions or thoughts? Okay, it's late. Um, so friends, thank you. I'm going to propose, and since you all have been doing, you know, heavy duty, it's not an expectation, but I'm going to propose that we convene next Saturday as well, maybe to do it until we really have ourselves together as a circle of trustees to look to these next Saturdays. So I invite everybody to make a mental note that a week from tonight, same time, we'll gather again and go into more depths on these issues. Perhaps Susan will have more to share about the national anthem. We'll have more to share. We'll, we'll, we will have had, I think, at least one meeting with our representatives of the different races around the degree offering. There'll be more, to, more updates to offer. Um, a week from tonight. Andrew, you have something to say. I may be in the air uh, that day, but I'll do my best to check out the recording. Wonderful. Well, we can, we can build it around people's schedules. Andrew thinks I'm going to take him to the airport. I'm going to let him go. That's okay. I know where Lyft is. <laughs> okay, friends. So thank you, one and all. The concluding verse. May our feelings penetrate into the center of our hearts and seek in love to unite themselves with the human beings seeking the same goal. 
with the spirit beings who bearing grace, strengthening us from realms of light and illuminating our love are gazing down upon our earnest, heartfelt striving. So thank you all. Um, Jay, if you could send me a rough sense of your schedule when you would not be available for this meeting with representatives of the different races around the degree offering, that would be helpful. We have almost the whole contingent. We will find a couple of peach colored colleagues, but um, if you could let me know when you wouldn't be available this week, because that circle is coming together, I'd be grateful. I'll send you a mail, Stuart. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, Stuart and Jay, I've sent you an email about the presentation I just made, so it's in your email. So please have any reply to any questions, and we'll follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Namaste. I'm out. Thank you all. Namaste. Thank you all very much. Okay, my night. Sweet dreams. Good to hear your voice, Huda. Bless. Good night. Thank you. Glad for joining us.